Today, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, digital twins or twin systems with uh, Erika Parn. Uh, Erika has uh, has uh, been once in on Beam Voice a few years ago. I, I don't know, two or three years ago. It's been a while since yeah. then. Yeah. Now we are doing an update because she's launching a very interesting book soon. Hi, Erika. Thank you very much for joining me. How are you Hi. doing? I'm good, thank you. It's great to be back. Yeah, the last time we spoke, I was uh, doing a bit of podcasting. Um, so that's how we connected in the past. What happened in the meantime with uh, digital twins? Um, are we getting anywhere or is just solidifying as a, um, as a buzzword? Well, I think we are we are definitely evolving towards reaching digital twin systems in the built environment. Um, we're still navigating from BIM and just digitization as a whole in the built environment. But, um, you know, digital twins are appearing and there are case studies now uh, quite a lot more than there were a few years back when I first joined Cambridge with the Center of Digital Built Britain. We're seeing a plethora of practical examples of twins in different sectors in the built environment. Um, but we still need some guidance and, and the industry still is kind of unsure what its purpose might be. And that's kind of the, the uh, push for this book between me and my co-authors is to provide some of that guidance. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Um, yeah, well, uh, we are talking like everyone knows you, but let's assume that uh, many people don't know you already. So yeah. please say a few words about yourself and also about the co-authors afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm Dr. Erica Parn. I'm a senior research associate at Cambridge University. I'm currently in the civil engineering department and I work closely with Professor Ioannis Brelakis. And um, my co-authors include Rafal Sachs, uh, Lucio Soibelman, and Mark Enzer. And initially, this book, the way it kind of started was Ioannis wanted to put together a book that was sort of similar to the BIM handbook with Rafal. And this is kind of like the digital twin handbook, but we are opting for the term twin systems because upon many hours of deliberation and debates we've come to this terminology of twin systems for the built environment it seems to be more fitting for uh, what we describe yeah um can i ask why so it's because as originally when the way in which all of our works coalesced mine and Ioannis's and mark enzer's was with the center of digital built britain and the viewpoint with all of the researchers' work was that the built environment is a system and it's a system of systems. And therefore any digital twin has to be designed with that purpose in mind. We shouldn't be stuck in the ways of the way in which BIM is implemented, which is more of an object oriented object driven uh, way of thinking. We have to think of a bigger picture and what is the ultimate purpose that the twin will serve and the built environment is made up of lots of little systems whether it's the infrastructure systems the public services systems that it then um, enables uh, the physical building systems and even within a building you have its own systems that operate so this is why we've opted for this term because it's inextricably linked with the whole built environment as a system and that's how we explain it in our book as well yeah it actually makes a lot of sense so yeah it sounds uh, top-notch uh, title and uh, also easy to understand uh, yeah we um, hope so. we hope we are not going to confuse the audience because there is a lot of confusion um at the moment in the industry as to what is a digital twin and i often you know hear this from practitioners that are still asking what is a digital twin um, you would think that we would kind of be already familiar with this terminology, but 
But no, I think the audience and the professionals in the industry are still struggling to really see the difference between BIM and a twin. Yeah, I agree. I think there there is a lot of uh, pollution or there has been because right now it's not like um, digital twin is a hot topic anymore. It's like we yeah. know about it, like about BIM as well. But I think there has been a lot, uh, also spread a lot of misconceptions uh, and uh, maybe some of that fault is coming from some software vendors who are trying to say that, yeah, they are doing digital twins or their tool is doing digital twins. And it's it's, it's confusing. Like people hear, hear first time about digital twin in, in a specific platform. So they think like, yeah, I need that platform and I have a digital twin. I can build it inside, right? Everything works there. They, they forget that, yeah, it, it's a complex topic uh, to try mm -hmm. to describe it with just using one tool. Because that's not yes. how things work. And I think there are many misconceptions that have been built up. And that's why that's the challenge. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, like, uh, what do you experience that you hear people describing digital twins as a wrong thing to be most often? Yeah. So there is one misconception, which is to think that this is a revolution and this is completely different. No, it's it's an evolution from where we were with BIM. So it's an evolution, not a revolution. And um, the other thing is that it's quite important distinction between the BIM and the twin is the ability to action your insights. So whereas we still are using BIM as sort of like a static repository, Ultimately, what a twin is supposed to enable is to create actions and to be able to see a historical record of what has been designed, but to be able to then also use that historical record to make forecasting or predictions into the future. So there's a couple of areas there that are going beyond where we were with BIM, the ability to create actions from those insights. And even to get to those insights is a challenge in its own right. Um, we're still kind of coming to grips with that in our industry. Mm -hmm. Then there's a lot of technological sort of changes as well. You know, we are seeing sensors being embedded into our infrastructure. And um, so the physical technology uh, is limited in a certain degree. I was speaking just a few weeks back at one of our conferences um, at our center with the industry representatives who were saying that sensors are being embedded, but they already know that within 20 years, those sensors are obsolete, but those physical roads and bridges will still be there. So our technology is changing rapidly. And um, it's also got to be able to live the same uh, lifespan as the physical assets themselves, but we know that it won't because technology changes so quickly. And we're seeing that definitely every, almost every month with AI tools that are being updated and, and launched on the market. So, you know, we talk about these things and other challenges that relate to digital twins for the built environment in our book. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, this this is this is amazing. Sounds uh, very comprehensive. Um, and um, you mentioned you 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 touched some interesting points in there. Uh, and just to clarify this, to make sure that I'm also looking at the things from the right perspective here. Could we ever consider a digital twin before a project is finished? Could we ever talk about a digital twin on the way of building built? Um. You mean as a continuous? Yeah, I mean like when you, when we build a new project, mm -hmm. can we talk about the digital twin before it's finished, or we talk about digital yes. twin only when the yes. project is done and it's no, used? no, 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 yeah. absolutely. That's one of the things we discuss in our book is the life cycle of a digital twin, right? So a digital twin will take form as soon as the project starts potentially, right? You are creating the information that is going to be used as the asset is then handed over and in use. Um, so the digital twin can be a twin at the design stages. You could have a twin at the construction stages as well. And then the twin of the physical assets themselves when they're handed over. So there are two types of twins. We make this distinction in the book, right? 
You could be talking about a product twin, which is the building itself, the walls, the floors, the doors, etc. Or you could be talking about the process twin, which could be the actions, the construction of that wall, the laying of the concrete. Those all could be twinned and operationalized, right? So you could be having a twin all the way from, if you think of the Reba stages, kind of at the very beginning through to handover and then continue its use. Um, this is really the kind of idealistic scenario, but it is happening and, and we're sort of starting to see that it's inevitable. It's something that we can't, uh, we can't stop. The industry is going to continue its digitalization, even though there is a lot of skepticism on the, on the um, industry side, but it's something that is just, as we see it, it's just inevitable. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But uh, yeah, like, um, unfortunately, with everything else, uh, it is going to take time. It is what it is. Yes. Uh, the, the technology and um, uh, the early adopters will just keep pushing it further until uh, it will, yeah, uh, it will become mainstream at some point. Um, by the way, everyone watching, uh, please try to press on that repost button right there and share it with your network. Maybe somebody else is interesting to watch this. It can be watched also after the event is done. You, you can replay it. So yeah, thank you for doing that. Uh, there is another uh, thing here. Uh, there are these twins uh, or digital twins that are built uh, with the project, but there might be also buildings that are already built, like complex yeah. building, I'm thinking, right? That. Yeah. Uh, there we start already like uh, with the building being there and converting the existing documentation into a digital twin, right? Did you see, I, I'm not, I, personally around me and the, where I work on, I, I work on, pro, on new projects. Mm -hmm. How do, do you see this kind of requirement? Like, did you hear about in your network or whatever? that there are companies okay i want to, yeah. to convert my building into a into a digital twin mm -hmm. i don't think the terminology of digital twin is used but it's already happening in terms of uh retrofit and renovation projects we are creating inevitably twins and and they are to a certain degree a twin uh, they might be missing the actionable insights part but we're generating them so you're seeing a lot of push even on, on the EU funding side in terms of promoting this uh, regeneration, renovation of existing and older buildings. You know, most of the buildings that are out there are already built. Most of our built environment is existing buildings that need renovation. And a key part of that is then capturing, monitoring what's there and modeling what's there and then getting to a stage where that information can be turned into actionable insights, whether it's to monitor degradation over time or um, for the sake of net zero or sustainability, it will be driven by different purposes. And that's another thing we highlight in the book is that it's got to be a purpose-driven digital twin rather than this arbitrary um, sort of ideal and yeah ideal. let's embed lots of sensors and see where it takes us if it's not driven by a purpose it becomes difficult to plan for a twin system but certainly in the um if we take the renovation market there's lots of developments there on the monitoring side uh you know lidar has become more accessible financially mm -hmm. more accessible so mm -hmm. this is creating an easier quicker way to create a twin or construct a twin but then there are other new emerging technologies like muon tomography that can give us the ability to see through walls and these technologies will soon also uh, kind of enter the market and become more freely available the cost of them will reduce so this step of constructing a twin will ultimately become easier mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah actually you you mentioned something really interesting there which i was thinking about uh, because i think yeah maybe we don't have a lot of um state of the art digital twins uh, because yeah uh, but i think this is also very subjective is not uh, mm. like 
depends on the need. It's important to be driven by need, like and to make sense from an investment point of view as well, right? Not just to build cool features because it's cool, like because you do it because that doing that you will save money, saving energy and uh, yeah, making more efficient your processes and so on. So I think that we also, like you said, I'm sure that we actually have a lot of semi twins, maybe right, which yeah. are on the on their way to become twins someday, Absolutely. maybe. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Like and everything starts with that with the documentation. It does. It does. And just like with BIM, the information requirements they will drive what you are able to then model and simulate as well. Um, and what sort of data you're capturing from that asset to then enable you to do those calculations for your actionable insights. So, and that is ultimately the differentiator with the twin. So going from BIM to twin is to be able to action those insights. So can I now generate some change within my assets operation with actuators through some sensors or with new processes? It, it's not all going to be fully autonomous. There will still be people in the loop. So maybe they are the ones to action uh, some of those changes. So some examples would be, um, you know, digital twins that are used for asset maintenance. Um, I've seen examples from outside of our sector in the defense sector where digital twins are used to then operationalize the maintenance of those assets. So for example, instead of generating a change to the physical asset, what you're doing is actually helping those that are maintaining those assets to be on up to speed and know exactly what they need to do when they're maintaining that asset. And that is an actionable insight. Although there's a human in the loop, you're using a twin to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a good, uh, good point indeed. Uh, you watching, uh, something important. I'm sure you have any questions about this. Don't hesitate to do that. Just type your uh, questions as a co uh, comment and we'll try to answer ongoing. Um, now, uh, I need to say something. Uh, this might be funny, might be outrageous for some of us, but I, like, I'm sure like I heard this several times. There are people um, who are, in a way, uh, they, they think that digital twins will replace BIM. They don't understand the interdependency between this and that, okay, digital things are actually depending on on, on BIM, the, the information that you put in these models, right? And mm -hmm. they, they think that, okay, now we, we ditch BIM, we don't need BIM anymore. We are going to do only digital twins. They forget that these are things that work together and they think that they will not need to work as hard as before to actually provide good information in their models, right? Which is very dumb because the, the the more information, not the more, sorry, this is not correct. The right amount, the, the closer to the right amount of the information we need for our purposes to design, to build, to maintain our yeah. buildings and our infrastructure projects, the better is going to, the more it will help us, the more money we are going to save during the maintenance yeah. and all the other stages, right? So stop fooling yourself and still... Mm -hmm plan to put the right amount of information in your, in your models that you have to, and think also about collaboration because this is important. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, it's, it's the BIM isn't going anywhere for the time being. We're just evolving how we're using BIM, right? So um, you have, when we talk about a twin system, you have like with humans, human twins, you have a digital twin and you have the physical twin. And that digital twin is made up of inevitably BIM and other information that is then used to drive changes in your physical twin. And it's important that, you know, we don't lose track of that. I don't think BIM is going anywhere. It's only going to, um, unfortunately, as, as people will realize, it's increasing in complexity because what we're trying to do is twin those physical assets and those physical processes all around us. But here's where the layer of AI comes to help us. So oftentimes, you know, people ask, well, what, what about AI? But AI is a layer 
which will be in every facet of technology that we're using. And AI is part of almost every life cycle stage of creating that digital twin, whether it's monitoring, right? So it's automatic detection of components from your point cloud scan, that's using AI, or with videogrammetry, automatic detection of components from videos and images. AI is a layer embedded in all of the technology that is then used with digital twins. It's not a kind of off the shelf thing that will be taken mm -hmm. and applied. It's embedded in everything. Um, and the same thing with, for instance, digital twin operations. So a big part of operating a twin is how do you interact with the twin? How do you retrieve that information? And we're seeing a huge rise uh, in chatbots and the use of large language models. And that's just one way of interacting with a digital twin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so true. That, that really makes sense. Like people are waiting for this big AI that will replace complete uh, com a person completely instead of forgetting and ignoring the fact that actually we are we have AI in so many facets of uh, Already, everything we yes. do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and that's the way that is going to keep developing. Yeah. And uh, our roles will still evolve at the interface between all these things to coordinate how these things interact. And yeah, um, you also right. said something that is a, this is a bad news, but it's bad news for who doesn't want to be better, who doesn't want a better be, be, uh, built environment. Yeah, mm. it's, it's good news for people who, who see the opportunity in this and who actually care about our planet. So I'm sorry yeah. for being harsh, but this is how I see things. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That's a good uh, point, Petra, actually, what you said about the planet. And this is a key part of the whole system's point of view. Your built environment is there to serve the natural world, the nature system, and the people world, the social system. Um, that's the kind of driving purpose. So wherever we're starting from with the twin systems, you've got to bear those two systems as well, the nature and the social element. Yeah, yeah. Um, before we go further, where uh, can people find more about the launch of your book? And what, what are some yeah. important details about the launch and when people would be able to purchase sure. it? Yeah, so the book will be available towards the end of this year. But if you're interested in the contents of our book, you can follow our YouTube page. We're going to be posting regular content about the book's content from our co-authors. Uh, almost every week there will be short videos and clips highlighting some of our key discussions and debates with the co-authors of our book. And you can pre-order the book on Amazon already now. Uh, but the best place is to follow us on our YouTube channel and also follow us on LinkedIn. We'll be posting stuff on LinkedIn through my page and my fellow co-authors. So that's Professor Ioannis Brilakis, Rafal Sachs, Lucia Soibelman, and Mark Enzer. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, what is the name of your YouTube channel? Uh, the name is Twin Systems Book. So if you just search for Twin Systems Book, you'll find our channel. Okay, all right. I'll make sure to put these uh, details in the description of the video where I publish on YouTube and um, in a comment afterwards. Fantastic. I just sent the page that you sent me, uh, which is, yeah. um, what is that page? That's just a starting page where you can find a link to our Amazon pre-order for the book and also a link to our YouTube channel. So mm -hmm. you're free to share that with your listeners. Yeah. Sure, I I just did it. And um, guys, keep uh, the comments coming because now we are, uh, I will read a few comments and we'll try to answer to them. Uh, Amar Kasem says, thank you for the clarification that uh, digital twin is an evolution, not a revolution. And that's how it's supposed to be. And then we have another question from Muslim uh, and the long name, sorry, uh, sir, for that. From, from your perspective, how far behind is the construction industry in adopting real and predictive digital twins? Mm. <laughs> yeah, we, we certainly a... are a little bit behind from, yeah, this is difficult to say in numbers. I haven't worked this out. You know, if you were going to, that's a whole, uh, somebody else is working that out in terms of numbers. But yeah, we are 
a little bit behind in some areas. Um, certainly, we're not exactly the same as manufacturing industry, although we are seeing a lot more industrialized construction and offsite construction. But even that scenario of offsite is not exactly the same level of autonomy that you might see in the automotive sector. A big reason for this is that just the nature of funding of research and development within our sector, if you compare us to uh, computer science or the IT sector, there's a lot more investment in internal R&D. Whereas mm -hmm. in the built environment, we don't spend that much money on R&D at all, no, nowhere nearly as much. So a big challenge and, and why we're doing this is actually to stimulate some of that research and development in the built environment. There isn't enough investment in R&D in our sector, which there should be. Um, so, but yeah, certainly in terms of simulation, uh, we are slightly behind and it's no secret that our sector has been slower to adopt digital technologies. However, you know, that is changing. Also, if you look at the amount of acquisition of companies, of technology companies in the built environment, that's quite high. So, yeah, we are still behind. However, we're evolving towards actually realizing that we need to catch up. Mm. And this is what drives, you know, a lot of the research domains. Why are we now looking into offsite and industrialized construction? Because we've realized that we have to adopt, we have to change the way in which we operate. Yeah, it's not so easy to answer to such a question because it's also very subjective, it depends on so many it factors, is. depends like where do you, like are we speaking locally? Because yeah. uh, globally, globally might take like a lot of time, depends like when it will happen in India, when it will happen in Norway, mm -hmm. uh, in the UK, it's a huge difference, right? Yes. And uh, depends also on the clients and the governments and so on. So there are so many factors in here. Mm -hmm. but... But I would I would say that, you know, I've also done research and spoken to representatives from outside of construction um, and the digital twins in advanced manufacturing and these other sectors like aerospace. They do have their own challenges that are still very similar to ours. And what are some of those key challenges? Well, it's integrating their systems or federating their twins. A lot of it is also a similar challenge to what we have in the built environment, interoperability. So we might look at these other industries and think they're ahead of us, but they have very similar issues and challenges as we do, which is interoperability and the challenge of exchanging data between subcontractors. We have the same challenge to overcome. Yeah. Uh, I think also uh, one of the challenges that makes it difficult to, to make everything off-site, we should not forget that we the buildings we are building have a specific location. Each project is built in one specific sp place, right? And yeah. It's not like we can build a offsite for each project everywhere, right? So this is another challenge. You will you need to transport everything to a specific place. You cannot choose that, right? That will be built in that space as well, place. And I think also even, of course, everything, all the processes are complex and so on. I think, especially when building a project, we have an amount, uh, an absurd amount of people involved in the project, which exceeds other industries uh, from mm -hmm. any level because you have to deal with so many people uh, from physical labor to to everyone yeah there are there are so many things happening in one or on a building site right and they are each building site is different than <laughs> each other one yeah. right so yeah. it, it's, it's so difficult to customize something to make something okay to modulize something right e except for yeah construction systems and so on but like the way we build, like it's so different from even in this inside the same company, you have two different teams, they work differently, right? Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely, yeah. And and you know, even even though we might be moving to off-site prefab components, we're still exposed to the elements wherever we're building on site. So we're not in the idealistic setting where everything can be optimized on site, but we're getting to a stage where we are twinning our activities on site. We have more information about what is happening on site than before. And 
eventually the technology and the user friendliness of these tools will improve and it will be a lot easier to twin mm -hmm. actually construction site activities and what's going on in in the field so to speak yeah all right let's move to the next question which is a good one we already have a lot of problems in implementing BIM. I completely agree. We still have. Yes. Yeah, I, I have. Yeah, like that's crazy. In your opinion, what kind of challenges the industry will face in terms of implementing the concept of digital twin? I appreciate if you focus on the technical part of the implementation besides the others. Okay, so federating twins, being able to connect, let's say, a MEP system twin to the built, the, the let's say the envelope twin. So again, interoperability is a challenge. Um, this is something that we still haven't quite figured out yet, but I'm seeing a lot of developments in this domain, including a spin-off, a startup company from Cambridge, from our department that is trying to tackle this challenge called Didimai. And, um, you know, there are, those that are trying to overcome the biggest challenge, which is federating and exchanging information freely, independent of what platform or system software you're using. Um, and the same challenge occurs in other sectors, like the defense sector, like aerospace, where they are already implementing twins. They're still struggling with federating or connecting twin systems to one another. That's where I'm going to say that we're going to have very similar issues. Another challenge is cybersecurity. So uh, if it's like connected or smart, it's vulnerable inevitably. So this is definitely going to be a challenge from the client's perspective. If you think about it, it's a risk you're taking if you're going to be twinning any kind of critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So cybersecurity is something that is often going to be a hindrance for the adoption of twins, but it shouldn't because even in the cybersecurity domain, digital twins are seen as a way to be able to preempt when you have a breach. So if you're twinning communications on your network and monitoring those, you can potentially use that twin to preempt any kind of unusual uh, behavior on your network. So I don't know, it's cybersecurity is something that people are kind of viewing as a potential hindrance, but it shouldn't because it can also be used to potentially br uh, detect any breaches. So definitely federation, integration of uh, sharing of data, that's going to be a challenge. And even customer acceptance, uh, that's another one, right? Because Let's say you're driving a smart car and it's got a digital twin. You as a customer or an owner of that vehicle, you might not even realize that your car has a digital twin. So there's going to be this challenge of, will the customer accept that their asset is being twinned? Do they even know that their asset is being twinned? So that's more like from a consumer end user point of view, how would a tenant feel about a building that's being twinned? And do they necessarily know that their building or asset is being twinned? Interesting. That Those are some interesting things. Um, and let's move to the next one. Um, from from Jurate Sadu, Saduikri, Saduikait. Sorry, guys. Uh, I'm not so good with... Uh, some now. Yeah, I, I, I recognize that name. That's okay. one of my former students. Hello, Yurat. Oh, yeah. Yurat. Okay, cool. Um, so this is a complex question. Digital twin does not necessarily require B models to record data gained from the sensors. However, mm. in industry, I believe we need implement BIM level of information, improve non-proprietary data so it could be readable during an operational use through Kobe spreadsheets. Uh, operation and maintenance manuals, data smiths files, uh, uh, MEP contents developing still behind. Should be, shouldn't be implement MEP modeling and non-proprietary metadata in B models to use to to used for uh, digital twins. 
Okay, that was a very, very long. long question. So could you just repeat the very last part of the question? Yeah, so the last part is the question, actually. Uh, the uh, MEP contents developing still behind. Okay. Uh, shouldn't be implement MEP modeling and non-proprietary metadata in B models to be used for digital twins? I'm really struggling with yeah, that. And, question. Like, yeah. Uh, so let, yeah, let me try to. What I would, what I would say is one thing I got from there, Yurata, is that um, you know we don't necessarily need a geometric representation when we're twinning processes, and that's something mm -hmm. that is true. You don't necessarily have to have a geometric representation of what you're twinning. But as a reference point, um, you more than likely will have some kind of visualization that will then link back to the physical asset itself. But not everything that you're twinning will have a geometric counterpart if you're twinning a process, for example, rather than the product itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, now let me try to uh, to say what I understood from from the rest of the comment. Uh, I see used here non proprietary um, data or metadata, and uh, I think in this case you like yeah it makes sense. Uh, that's something that is part of one of the my most important goals to promote keep promoting IFC, which is the, exactly what it is. It's a non-proprietary format for interoperability in AEC. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is a, this is a, yeah, it's something that is happening. Uh, and um, regarding MEP, um, we are like, I don't see any difference for me in Norway. I'm talking from here. Uh, I don't see any difference in the quality of the models in MEP and uh, structural, for example, or architectural. We are on par with that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, maybe there are some challenges in other places, but the, the requirements are the same. Like we, we need the right amount of information in the models to build, to the, um, to order things, to build and to, to maintain. So um, I definitely agree, like to answer to her question, metadata mm -hmm. uh, definitely should, should enforce the same requirements that we enforce also for its structural and architectural and everything else and take it further than in digital twins, of, co of course, it should not be any difference between the discipline. All the discipline yeah. should have the same requirements. But yeah, of yeah. course, yeah, of course. I, I mean, like the the level of the requirements, they will different because yeah, they, they some some kind of information is relevant for architectural or structural and is not relevant for mm -hmm. MEP. Mm -hmm. I I don't know if you, you want Thank to you add. For Clarifying. If you want to add, it, it, I know it's it, it's I'm struggling with the text yeah. because it's it's too long, unfortunately. Very Sorry, Jurate. Uh, but uh, I hope this somehow answered to your question. Yeah, the, like that's it's happening. Like the, uh, more data in not pro, non-proprietary format is happening in Norway, and I'm mm -hmm. sure it's happening. I see a lot of movement in Europe. Yeah. Also, so it's happening. This is happening, and not only MEP. MEP is a part of the the whole. Uh, uh, package of disciplines so mm -hmm. uh favor agbajor uh good good insights on digital twins could you highlight some strategies to promote digital twin adoption in the built environment please mm. that's the million dollar question no <laughs> but that is a challenge yeah definitely and and okay so how do we get uh the industry to begin the journey uh, okay, we're businesses and we're driven by ultimately what's the return on investment. A key part of this is oftentimes actually thinking about the business model. Okay, so if you're going to be implementing a digital twin, are you able to see already or project in that you can create some sort of potential new service? And that's what I've seen in other sectors where it's been successfully implemented is that it's hand in hand with a new commercial business model. So that is usually around services with your asset. So when the asset is handed over, there are these additional services that are then delivered to the end user. Oftentimes in relation to maintenance, or maybe it's to meet some sort of like uh, conditions-based um, 
contract where you're guaranteeing the performance of something. So a digital twin is then used to guarantee that in your service offering. So a big part is actually to not just think, oh, okay, we're going to, you know, only design this digital twin and, and embed lots of sensors and collect lots of data and potentially we'll find some insights in there. No, think of a commercial use case for it. And oftentimes what I've seen in other sectors, it's a servitization model. It's a service that's then added on to that asset and it's an expansion of revenue. So you're not only just saying, okay, a digital twin enables us to save money and time because now we can uh, basically maintain the asset just in time, but it's actually enabled us to expand our services and generate new revenue because now we realize that there's certain parts of the asset that behave in this way, and maybe we can introduce a new service out of it. And mm -hmm. uh, I talked about this in my previous research, which I collaborated on with Dr. Michael Greaves and my other colleagues, Dr. Mohamed Zaki from Cambridge Service Alliance, where we looked at business models with digital twins. And we specifically looked at how digital twins are being implemented in other sectors and what their commercial models look like. And oftentimes it goes a lot more beyond just, um, you know, in a manufacturing setting where you're just optimizing production. It's also about when the asset is handed over, can you create a better customer experience and a new service to that end user? Yeah, these are great points. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, next question, leveraging digital twins in uh, virtual demonstrations, mixed reality to achieve net zero and enhance sustainability represents a highly promising field, especially for stakeholder engagement. It's a remark, it's not a question. Um, a question from Steve Janakis. What happens in a major construction project uh, what happens if, in a major construction project, the consultants are implementing BIM, but the building contractors say they do not need to use BIM? Um, hey, that's a, a BIM question. Yeah, I can, I can, uh, I can yeah. answer to this. Yeah, I think this, this does not. To be honest, I, this does not really make sense because this should be decided At in the, the contracting. Beginning. Exactly yeah. depends on the ki the type of the how the project will be built mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that that should be a part uh, contractual stuff uh, yeah. so that should it be can set be... out right at the beginning of any yeah project. yeah yeah I i'm sure this can be a, a real case that happens somewhere uh, i'm i'm sure that this more can than be likely a real it problem. happens more than we like to admit but mm -hmm. yeah but uh, my personal opinion is that that would be a waste like uh, like uh, without having anything to think about contractual stuff like that's a waste right uh, yeah. I'm uh, like uh, working as a BIM coordinator for general contractor. We build based on this model. So that mm -hmm. would be a real, real waste of, of data, of effort, of money at the end of the day, right? That's not, not BIM-like. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, that would be just a waste. Uh, and yeah. uh, at the end of the day, I think also depends also on the client, what the client will have. Like yeah. um, what the, Oftentimes there it's are... driven by what the client yeah. is. Mm -hmm. demanding yeah is the contract and the the, the client here but uh, unfortunately things like this happen but it's not normal it's not the ideal workflow no the ideal workflow is that all the stakeholders should be included in this process and they should use that data that's that has been invested so much time and money to to harvest it to create it yeah mm. um Julio Leston Bandeira, what is your opinion on the role of open source technologies like Brick Schema in turning application of digital twin applications more frequently approached as natural ways top deal to deal with the built environment? So this is more to do with the, oh, is this alternatives to IFC? I'm no, it's not an no. Brick no? schema is not an alternative uh, to IFC. I think it's more for electrical or MEP, something like that. A way of describing this, but I could be wrong. I it's been a long time since I've been looking at this, mm -hmm. uh, but I think um, so. Open source technologies, um, yeah, like to to include yeah to in turning application 
yeah so let's let's think uh, about this like do you mm. see any like th because this is actually interesting do, do we see any any interesting open source projects uh, around digital twins or it's only proprietary platforms that are owned by somebody that you need to pay to to get access to and so on no definitely i think everything usually will have its start in some form in an open source format um, you can take examples of um, the data sets that were originally published by Stanford that were then used for automatic detection of objects with LIDAR. So we definitely rely on a lot of open source in the beginning of developing any of these technologies. And, uh, and certainly it always has a start in some sort of academic context, which is almost always published as an open source data set, um, which then slowly makes its way to the commercial domain where it's enhanced and then sold as a, as a product. So yeah, open source, you know, it has its, its place, but um, whether that's gonna be driving the main innovation, the main products that are being used I don't know, not not fully, but it will have a start in in open source. That's where we all start with some of these areas. Mm. Um, Davide Coccolini, uh, let's say hello. I noticed the book pre-order is just for uh, Kindle Amazon. Yeah, for the for the Kindle. Uh, yes, but I was wondering about the paper version of it, like a BIM handbook. Uh, there will be a paper version as well at the end of the year. Closer okay. towards December, there will be a paper version as well. Okay. So you got your answer, uh, Davide. I hope you're uh, satisfied with that. But uh, you'll need to wait until December. But it wouldn't um, be a book on digital twins without having a digital version of it. So that's got to <laughs> be done. <laughs> that would be a... That would be an interesting irony, but yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, I, if I think it was only would... available in paperback and not. Yeah, I, I think you would lose some credibility <laughs> right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, that that's a that's a good point. All right, um, I think we, we don't have any other enough. questions. So yeah. um, let me um, uh, ask you uh, one last thing before we wrap it up. Uh, who is this book for? Who should be interested? Like I'm a BIM coordinator, you are a researcher. Who should yeah. be interested to buy this book? Anybody that's confused about digital twins for the built environment. Um, we wanted to make this book sort of accessible for practitioners and researchers as well. We explain from our point of view how it can be constructed, designed, planned, and implemented for the built environment. We might, it's not a very technical book. The purpose is not to be a information systems kind of book that is giving you the technical detail. No, we're giving an overview, just in general, the principles of a twin system, how to plan it, design it, construct it, and operate it for the built environment. That sounds good. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, so, uh, how I would say this would be like, doesn't matter if you are an engineer, being coordinator, being manager, architect, MEP, model. Or a planner, or a or city planner. planner or yeah. a client, or client. Uh, exactly, or uh, whatever you are doing, yeah. Uh, working in maintenance, like this should be, should provide you a good uh, starting point in the world of digital twins, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Just like BIM did you know, for all of the different stakeholders a few years back when the BIM handbook was written as well. All right. Uh, I'm not sure if we did not mention yet, what is going to be the earliest date that we are going to, like uh, somebody can have the full book available? Um, Do you have any idea about this? December, end of the year, December. Okay, so end of the year. And mm -hmm. then what is happening until then? Like what What we are going to see on your YouTube channel? and the Yeah, on the so pages. on our YouTube channel, we will be publishing short videos and content from the book, from the co-authors. My dialogue with Ioannis, Mark Enzer, Lucia Soibelman, and Rafal Sachs, where we explain some of the key ideas, the concepts that we then elaborate on in our book. So 
yeah, we definitely want to get followers. We're keen on people, you know, giving comments and giving us some feedback. So, you know, while we're finalizing and polishing the book, it'll be guided by some of the comments and the feedback from the audience as well. So definitely we want to see people, you know, following us and uh, and engaging with us. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Erika, for joining. Thank you. It was a Thank great you. chat. I'm very happy to, to learn all these new things about uh, digital twins. And um, I'm looking forward to, to the book. Fantastic. Thank you to you and your audience. Thank you, everyone, for joining and for your questions. Great questions and uh, many of them. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.